And we're back. Kill the Cat Radio, KTCR, Season 1, Episode 6. Still on the air. Still curious. Because y'all know what killed the cat and exactly what brought it back. You know, for as long as I can remember, I always wanted to write stories. Now, as a young man coming out of a small town in Rhode Island, U.S. of A., the chances, at least in my mind, of spreading my wings into the literary world seemed like a fanciful dream. I didn't know much about literature or the history of its long, great Western tradition. I did excel in my studies, however, and it was my attendance in honors English classes in high school where I was first introduced to what people now refer to as the canon. Public schools can only offer so much, especially here in the United States, but luckily, I had some amazing teachers who are more than willing to recommend to me some very interesting pieces of literature. Previously to these scholarly leanings, my tastes in books were primarily of the pop fiction variety, a steady diet of Stephen King and Dean R. Kuntz horror novels, or perhaps the short but excitable embrace of fantasy fiction. But the remarkable 20th century of literature was primarily regulated to English and American authors. I got my fill of Mark Twain and Mr. Hemingway, learned all about the poetry of T.S. Eliot and the heart-wrenching passion of Mr. F. Scott Fitzgerald. We dove right into Salinger and we learned all about the majestic James Baldwin. Then when I moved into the university system and decided to major in English literature, I floated up to what could be considered literary heaven. Now all of my courses were devoted to the world of the writer. Funny enough, this oddly didn't inspire me in my own personal writings, however strange that may sound call it youth or even laziness, but my output of writing didn't explode until I turned 30 and moved to New York City. There was one crowning event that did occur, however, during those university days, and that was the discovery of an author that blew my mind, completely destroying and equally inspiring my entire creative flow. That was the first time I read the Czech-born Parisian expat author named Milan Kundera. It was luck and happenstance. A classically trained musician turned me on to this man's fiction at a cafe patio in the dreary corporate monoculture of Southern California. The work itself? It was Kundera's immortality, the high watermark of his entire career. Now where to even begin? Milan Kundera's work is unlike anyone else's in the 20th century. He breaks away from the simple plot-driven narrative tone to cross space and time. He interrupts basic structure and interjects philosophical treaties that are then deconstructed in real time. He even interrupts his own novels himself, inserting himself into the narrative as it unfolds. He plays with time and structure, like a composer before a great orchestra, pairing his favorite themes, sex, politics, memory, death, and runs a parallel to some of the more memorable characters of the 20th century. William Faulkner came close to this kind of experimentation. Sure, Henry Miller played with some of these ideas. Lawrence Durrell did it with his Alexandria Quartet. But Kundera stood out like a giant, channeling his vision of a new kind of literary work. He didn't have a sentimental side, and some of his dalliances into the sexual realms were downright methodical. But there was a clear thesis. There was a clear motive. The exploration of mankind's place in and of itself and how we as a society function together, leaving no ugly side of the stone unturned. And then there's the writing. Let's start with a passage out of his third novel, The Book of Laughter and Forgetting. The bloody massacre in Bangladesh quickly covered over the memory of the Russian invasion of Czechoslovakia. The assassination of Allende drowned out the groans of Bangladesh. The war in the Sinai Desert made people forget about Allende. The Cambodian massacre made people forget about Sinai. And so on and so forth until ultimately everybody lets everything be forgotten. In times when history still moves slowly, events were few and far between and easily committed to memory. They formed a commonly accepted backdrop for thrilling scenes of adventure. Nowadays, history moves at a brisk clip. A historical event, though soon forgotten, sparkles the morning after with the dew of novelty. No longer a backdrop, 
It is now the adventure itself, an adventure enacted before the backdrop of the commonly accepted banality of private life. Since we can no longer assume any single historical event, no matter how recent to be common knowledge, I must treat events dating back only a few years as if they were a thousand years old. In 1939, German troops marched into Bohemia, and the Czech states ceased to exist. In 1945, Russian troops marched into Bohemia, and the country was once again declared an independent republic. The people showed great enthusiasm for Russia, which had driven the Germans from their country. And because they considered the Czech Communist Party its faithful representative, they shifted their sympathies to it. So it happened that in February 1948, the communists took power not in bloodshed and violence, but to the cheers of about half the population. And please note, the half that cheered was the more dynamic, the more intelligent, the better half. Yes, say what you will, the communists were more intelligent. They had a grandiose program, a plan for a brand new world in which everyone would find his place. The communist opponents had no great dream. All they had was a few moral principles, stale and lifeless, to patch up the tattered trousers of the established order. So of course the grandiose enthusiasts won out over the cautious compromisers and lost no time turning their dream into reality. The creation of an idol of justice for all. Now let me repeat, an idol for all. People have always aspired to an idol. A garden where nightingales sing, a realm of harmony where the world does not rise up as a stranger against man nor man against other men, where all the world and all its people are molded from a single stock, and the fire lightening up the heavens is the fire burning in the hearts of men, where every man is a note in a magnificent Bach fugue, and anyone who refuses his note is merely a black dot, useless and meaningless, easily caught and squashed between the fingers like an insect. From the start, there were people who realized they lacked the proper temperament for the idol and wished to leave the country. But since by definition, an idol is a world for all, the people who wished to emigrate were implicitly denied its validity. Instead of going abroad, they went behind bars. They were soon joined by thousands and tens of thousands more, including many communists, such as Foreign Minister Clementis, the man who lent Gottwald his cap. Timid lovers held hands on movie screens. Marital infidelity received harsh penalties at citizens' courts of honor. Nightingales sang, and the body of Clementus swung back and forth like a bell ringing in the new dawn for mankind. And suddenly those young, intelligent radicals had the strange feeling of having sent something into the world, a deed of their own making, which had taken on a life of its own, lost all resemblance to the original idea, and totally ignored the originators of the idea. So those young intellectual radicals started shouting to their deed, calling it back, scolding it, chasing it, hunting it down. If I were to write a novel about that generation of talented radical thinkers, I would call it Stalking a Lost Deed. This is classic Kundera. Create a theme, share it explicitly with the audience, and then use his characters and the plot of the novel to prove the theory. Listen to how he introduces his characters. Take this forthright introduction to Tamina in the Book of Laughter and Forgetting. According to my calculations, there are two or three new fictional characters baptized on Earth every second. As a result, I am always unsure of myself when it comes time for me to enter that vast crowd of John the Baptists. But what can I do? I have to call my character something, don't I? Well, this time, just to make it clear, my heroine belongs to me and me alone, and means more to me than anyone ever has. I am giving her a name no woman has ever had before, Tamina. I picture her as tall and beautiful, 33 and a native of Prague. I can see her now walking down a street in a provincial town in the west of Europe. Yes, you're right. Prague, which is very far away, I call by its name. While the town in my story takes place in, I leave anonymous. It goes against all rules of perspective, but you'll just have to put up with it. Tamina has a job as a waitress in a small cafe belonging to a married couple. The cafe brought in so little money, the husband took a job somewhere else, and they hired Tamina to take his place. The difference between the miserable salary he earned at his new job, and even the more miserable salary they gave Tamina was their only profit. Tamina served the customers their coffee and Calvados, and then goes back to her place behind the bar. 
There's almost always someone sitting on a bar stool wanting to talk to her. They all like her. She's a good listener. But does she really listen? Or does she just look on, silent and preoccupied? I can't quite tell. And it really doesn't matter that much. What does matter is that she never interrupts anybody. You know what it's like when two people start a conversation. First, one of them does all the talking. The other breaks in with, that's just like me, I... And goes on talking about himself. Until his partner finds a chance to say, that's just like me, I... The, that's just like me, eyes may look like a form of agreement. A way of carrying the other party's idea a step further. But that is an illusion. What they really are is a brute revolt against brute force. An attempt to free one's ears from bondage. A frontal attack, the objective of which is to occupy the enemy's ear. All man's life amongst men is nothing more than a battle for the ears of others. The whole secret of Tamina's popularity is that she has no desire to talk about herself. She offers no resistance to the forces occupying her ear. She never says, that's just like me, I... You see, now we're in Tamina's world, and this is why my early artistic mind was blown away. I have never read, and certainly not had written, anything that could harness this heavy intellectualism with such easy grace. Just listen to the titles of his novels. The Joke, Life is Elsewhere, The Book of Laughter and Forgetting, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, Immortality, Slowness, Identity, Ignorance, and his last one in 2014, The Festival of Insignificance. Sure, right off the bat, the critics had tried to paint him as some arrogant flaunter of highbrow intellectual jargon. But it's through his meta-narrative that proves he is aware of what the novel is and what it could be. He's even more aware of what people will say about him, and he just doesn't care. He was a professor of world literature and studied cinematic history and musicology. That was until his political opinions led to his expulsion from the Communist Party. Now, they had let him back in briefly until 1970 when he was expelled again for his political dissent. His books were ripped off from the shelves of the libraries, and he was stripped of his professorship. He, like any great artist, sought complete freedom to say and live as one wished. He moved to Paris in 1975. The Czech government revoked his citizenship accordingly, but he has remained a French citizen since 1981 and still lives there today. Yes, folks. The man is 91 years old and walking around the streets of Paris. It was his first novel, The Joke, a serious critique of communist totalitarianism that got him blacklisted and banned in Czechoslovakia. However, it was there in Paris when he embarked fully into his career as an author. Worldwide fame arrived in Kundera's life at the age of 55 when he released the novel The Unbearable Lightness of Being. The novel was instantly controversial for its unabashed views of sexuality, and his oftentimes misunderstood characterizations of masculinity and femininity. The tale is about four lovers, two couples, Tomas and Teresa, and Franz and Sabina. To complicate things even more, Kundera opens with another complex idea, Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy of eternal recurrence. Then, evolving from there, he introduces another theory of light and weight. All metaphors, of course. And this is just in the first three pages. It's heavy business. I'll let the novel tell it. The idea of eternal return is a mysterious one, and Nietzsche has often perplexed other philosophers with it. To think that everything recurs as we once experienced it, and that recurrence itself recurs ad infinitum. What does this mad myth signify? Putting it negatively, the myth of eternal return states that a life which disappears once and for all, and which does not return, is like a shadow, without weight, dead in advance. And whether it was horrible, beautiful, or sublime, its horror, sublimity, and beauty meant nothing. We need take no more note of it than a war between two African kingdoms in the 14th century. A war that altered nothing in the destiny of the world. Even if a hundred thousand Africans perished in excruciating torment, Will the war between two African kingdoms in the 14th century itself be altered if it recurs again and again in eternal return? It will. It will become a solid mass. 
If the French Revolution were to recur eternally, French historians would be less proud of Robespierre. But because they deal with something that will not return, the bloody years of the revolution have turned into mere words, theories, and discussions, having become lighter than feathers, frightening no one. There's an infinite difference between a Robespierre who occurs only once in history and a Robespierre who eternally returns, chopping off French heads. Let us therefore agree that the idea of eternal return implies a perspective from which things appear other than as we know them. They appear without the mitigating circumstance of their transitory nature. This mitigating circumstance prevents us from coming to a verdict. For how can we condemn something that is ephemeral, in transit? In the sunset of disillusion, everything is illuminated by the aura of nostalgia, even the guillotine. Not long ago, I caught myself experiencing a most incredible sensation. Leafing through a book on Hitler, I was touched by some of his portraits. They reminded me of my childhood. I grew up during the war. Several members of my family perished in Hitler's concentration camps. But what were their deaths compared with the memories of a lost period in my life? A period that would never return. This reconciliation with Hitler reveals the most profound moral perversity of a world that rests essentially on the non-existence of return. For in this world, everything is pardoned in advance and therefore everything is cynically permitted. If every second of our lives recurs an infinite number of times, then we are nailed to eternity as Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross. It is a terrifying prospect. In a world of eternal return, the weight of unbearable responsibility lies heavy on every move we make. That is why Nietzsche called the idea of eternal return the heaviest of burdens. If eternal return is the heaviness of burdens, then our lives can stand out against it in all of its splendid lightness. But is heaviness truly deplorable and lightness splendid? The heaviest of burdens crushes us. We sink beneath it. It pins us to the ground. But in the love poetry of every age, a woman longs to be weighed down by the man's body. The heaviness of burdens is therefore simultaneously an image of life's most intense fulfillment. The heavier the burden, the closer our lives come to the earth, and the more real and truthful they become. Conversely, the absolute absence of a burden causes man to be lighter than air to soar into the heights, to take a leave of the earth and his earthly being and become only half real, his movements as free as they are insignificant. So what then shall we choose? Weight or lightness? Parmenides posed this very question in the sixth century before Christ. He saw the world divided into pairs of opposites, light, darkness, fineness, coarseness, warmth, cold, being, non-being, one half of the opposition he called positive, light, fineness, warmth, being, the other negative. We might find this division into positive and negative poles childishly simple, except for one difficulty. Which one is positive, weight or lightness? Parmenides responded, lightness is positive, weight negative. Was he correct or not? That is the question. The only certainty is, the lightness weight opposition is the most mysterious and most ambiguous of them all. Then the actual story starts. He introduces the characters. Tomas and his mistress, Sabina, represent this lightness, a place of pure freedom, unrestrained by the consequence of common morals. However, they really have no significance because they stand for nothing. Conversely, Franz and Teresa represent the idea of weight drenched in a world of meaning and responsibility, but totally unfree. Again, this is what Kundera does so eloquently, fusing philosophy and the art of the novel together to create his masterstroke, a novel like no other. I wanted in this podcast to read so many more passages to you tonight, but I realize I'd be taking away from your own experience to discover them for yourselves. They are simply too brilliant to be mucked up by me reading them here in this format. So I will move on to a particular gripe I have regarding some of Kundera's detractors. In true Kunderian fashion, I like to take this moment and refer to this section as a defense of Kundera or the destruction of subtlety. Let's get down to his critics. We all know that most critics' words aren't even worth the paper they're printed on. 
Most of the time, a critic's job is to reflect the views of their publishers, or whatever side of the societal spectrum they align themselves with. I mean, I'm sure they still want to be invited to the parties they love, no? Isn't it ironic that Kundera was banned in his own country for speaking out against the so-called moral majority of the Communist Party in Czechoslovakia? And now, in today's politically correct climate, he will yet again be banned for the same outrageous reasons, for enlightening topics that most of the pearl-clutching Western world will shy away from, particularly sex and the sexual nature of men and women. Let's just be frank and straight up about it. Most of his protagonists are women. Yeah, that's what he does. Now, for some reason, this infuriates certain people. How can a man ever write accurately about a woman's experiences? Shouldn't he only focus on what he knows? The male experience? Shouldn't he remain regulated to his lane? This is a true story. I was in a creative writing class, and the last one I'll ever attend, by the way. I was actually told by my professor that a man could never write a believable female character. That's right, in a creative writing class. Let me repeat, creative writing. Not journalism, not nonfiction, creative writing class. Of course, always a person who challenges any kind of tyrannical thought in all of its forms, I asked, well, can a female writer write a believable male character? Not a second later, the professor, yes, a woman said, of course. Oh really, how's that, I said. Because the oppressed always knows their oppressor inside and out. Now, I don't know about you, dear listener, but that sounds like a bunch of bullshit to me. The whole point of being a fiction writer is to imagine your characters so well that they literally walk off the page and become real. That's the talent of writing, no matter what gender you are. All of Kandera's characters, both men and women, are highly complex creatures. Some are brave. Some are cowards. Some learn from their experiences. Some remain in ignorance. But Kandera, above all, treats each character with respect and dignity. They don't always say or think or act appropriately, but we are not reading fiction for moral clarity. We are reading to view the world in some literary mirror, and sometimes our reflections are not that pretty. Kundera is virtually ignored by literary critics, and every university steers way clear for him for their own silly reasons, which is a shame. So many kids won't even be able to read this man or even know that he exists. But interestingly enough, his books still sell. At the local bookstore here in Brooklyn, I try to find another copy of The Unbearable Lightness of Being. I give away all my favorite books, so I have to keep rebuying them. The clerk explained to me, that book never stays on the shelves for very long. This made me smile. I felt as if it was some victory. I imagine the old man walking the streets of Paris, watching everything, wondering what each gesture or movement symbolized. Or, if not that, just how good the espresso he had that morning was. I'm gonna let Mr. Kundera take us out. Here's an excerpt from an interview with the late, great Philip Roth. I am wary of the words pessimism and optimism. A novel does not assert anything. A novel searches and poses questions. I don't know whether my nation will perish, and I don't know which of my characters is right. I invent stories and confront one with another. And by this means, I ask questions. The stupidity of people comes from having an answer for everything. The wisdom of the novel comes from having a question for everything. When Don Quixote went out into the world, that world turned into a mystery before his eyes. That is the legacy of the first European novel to the entire subsequent history of the novel. The novelist teaches the reader to comprehend the world as a question. There is wisdom and tolerance in that attitude. In a world built on sacrosanct certainties, the novel is dead. The totalitarian world, whether founded on Marx or Islam or anything else, is a world of answers rather than a world of questions. And there, the novel has no place. In any case, it seems to me that all over the world, people nowadays prefer to judge rather than to understand, to answer rather than to ask, so that the voice of the novel can hardly be heard over the noisy foolishness of human certainties.
that's it for this week. I'm Matthew Diabate. This is KTCR, Kill the Cat Radio. Stay curious out there, folks. See you next week.